All right, hello everybody. Welcome to AP Physics Calc Based, where today we're going to talk about air resistance. Now, drag and air resistance, these are variable forces that oppose motion in either a fluid or air. There's a couple of equations that we typically use with drag or air resistance. One of them is, the most popular one is negative B, some constant B, times the velocity. This will tell us what the force of the air resistance is. Now notice this force is based on how fast the object is going. The faster it goes, the higher the force. You can also have the relationship that the force of air resistance is some constant C value times the velocity squared. These situations kind of depend on a few factors, including um, humidity and how big the object is, and lots of other factors that kind of, or the density of the object, all those factor into the constants that these um, things should see. So the first thing I want to talk about is what's the big deal with, uh, with air resistance in the first place? Well, typically when you jump out of an airplane, we're going to talk about a lot, a lot of airplane jumping out of today. If you jump out of an airplane, as, the, the, as soon as you leave that airplane, your acceleration due to the acceleration is just gravity. A equals G. But after a good bit of time, you then start to pick up some speed because the acceleration acts on you for some period of time. And then your acceleration begins to slow down. It becomes less than g until finally you reach a point called terminal velocity. And terminal velocity is when the, you reach a constant speed. Now the only way that you can reach a constant speed is if your forces are in equilibrium. So which forces have to be applied here? Well, clearly we have to have the force due to gravity. That's definitely pulling you down. But there must also be another force going straight up that is an equal and opposite magnitude. And that force must be the force of air resistance. Now, if we break down these formulas, we know that any forces that are in equilibrium are equal and opposite to each other. So if we look at this from the perspective that your force of air resistance is typically equal to some equation that involves velocity. We're going to use a positive this time because technically we've already taken care of the negative and the fact that they're equal to each other. We can then use that to solve for this velocity here. That would give us that the velocity is equal to m g over b. I'm writing this in a specific way to show you that the velocity will equal some fraction of gravity. Okay, That terminal velocity will be some fraction of gravity. And so this is the value. This is always how you're going to find terminal velocity if your air resistance is given by this value here. Now, terminal velocity is how the fastest that you're probably going to go as you fall. It isn't, however, how fast you're falling during the entirety of the, the, the motion, though. How fast you're falling, your velocity time graph, is going to start at, typically start at whatever your initial velocity is. In this case, we'll pretend our initial velocity is zero. And over time, it's not going to go straight up like it typically does. Instead, it's going to curve up until it reaches our terminal velocity value. Now we're going to check back in with this equation because it's going to be useful later. Before I move on, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what is the value of this whole equation. What is the velocity time equation? We can actually figure that out using this relationship here and this relationship here. Okay. So let's talk about what's happening in the meantime. Before we get to terminal velocity, we're definitely accelerating. Okay? So if we're accelerating, if we're dealing with a dynamic situation, that means we're going to have an unbalanced force. The sum of all forces will then equal the mass times the current acceleration. Now I'm going to switch this around real quick and say that the MA equals sum of all forces. 
Now, what are these forces that are involved here in the middle of the situation? Well, we still have gravity. Gravity is pretty constant. You're still going to have gravity pulling you down. But then you're going to have the, the air resistance also pulling or uh, reacting to that gravity pulling you down. So now if we got acceleration by itself, we'll have mg minus bv and each of those over m. That's going to leave me with my acceleration value is equal to g minus b over m v. Okay. Now, something I want to point out here. This is what we call a first order differential equation. Why? The acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. However, velocity is inside that equation. So not only do you have a derivative, but the y value of that derivative is inside the equation too. I'm going to call this a first order differential equation. It's a derivative that has the dependent variable in the equation. This is the dependent variable, phi. And these, these uh, um, first order differential equations tend to have a similar setup, and tend to have a similar formula, and tend to have a similar graph. So that's always really nice, because everything kind of balances out for you. So let's, before we get too much further, let's talk about a little bit of calc review. Okay. One thing we need to remember is what is one over the anti or sorry the antiderivative of one over y dy. If you said the natural log of y, you're correct. Technically plus c. We'll get back to that in just a second. Let's make that a little harder. Let's call it one over three minus two y dy. What would that antiderivative be? Well, technically, there's a u substitution here. So the way the u substitution works is you're supposed to take some u value that's going to replace this part, 3 minus 2y. And then for every u, you're going to need a du as well. And that'll be negative 2 dy, which you don't quite have yet. So what you'll do is you'll put a negative 2 on the inside and a negative 1 half on the outside. That's going to replace each of these parts with u is going to replace the bottom and du is going to replace the negative 2 dy. Now it looks a lot like what we had up here. So that antiderivative becomes negative 1 over 2, the natural log of u plus c. So if we have more than just a y in the denominator, we have to execute a u sub. What typically ends up happening is whatever is multiplying to y ends up dividing on the outside of the system. To finish writing this equation, we're going to put the 3 minus 2y back in the equation plus c. So maybe this will make it a little more clear. Whatever was inside or underneath the fraction, the derivative of that ends up dividing on the outside. That's an important case, or an important example of what we're about to do next. The goal is we're going to come up with a velocity equation, a velocity versus time equation. But right now we have the derivative of the velocity time equation. So what we're going to do with that is we're going to anti-derive this equation. We have an issue. If we want to anti-derive this, we need to get all v's on one side of the equation and all dt's on the other side of the equation. That means that I'm going to take this entire group and call it 1 over g minus b over m v. That's going to come all the way to the right hand side, the left hand side. Then I'll multiply dt to the other side and get 1 over g minus b over m v dv equals 1 dt. Now what I've done here is I've gotten all the v's to one side and all the t's to the other side. Now I can anti-derive them individually. On the right side, the antiderivative of 1 is just 1t 
plus c. On the left side, this antiderivative is way more complex, but it's very similar to the antiderivative that I just did here. It's going to end up being, instead of 3 and negative 2, we have g and negative b over m. Ultimately, what we're going to end up with is this complex equation here. So, if we kind of just put in what we see here, here, we can do the natural log of g minus b over m v. We don't need to write a plus c on this side because we took care of the plus c over here. But remember, we're dividing by the derivative of this. Well, the derivative of that is negative b over m. So 1 over that is just going to flip it over to make it negative m over b. Okay? All right. We're almost there. We just have to get v by itself. So this is where the algebra comes in. We're going to start by dividing both sides by negative m over b, which is going to get me negative b over m t plus c. You can distribute this to see if you want, but it's not really going to matter. Then we're going to take the e to the power of both sides. That's going to cancel out the ln and give me g minus b over m v equals e to the negative b over m t plus c. Now something else we should remember from calculus, or even from pre-calculus, that if you have two things adding together, that used to be two separate e's multiplying to each other. Since c can be anything at once, it can just be c like this as well. We'll get back to that in just a second over here. This is going to turn into c times e to the negative b over mt. It's a little calculus trick you're going to pick up in your calc class. To continue to solve for v, we're going to subtract the g to the other side. We're going to multiply both sides by negative m over b. getting closer. This is now going to turn into g m over b plus c over, excuse me, plus c e to the negative b over m t. Now before we get any further we need to figure out what c is. Something we can bet on is that the initial velocity is going to equal zero. So that means if I plug zero into time, I'm going to get zero into velocity. So if I do that, m g over b plus c e to the zero power, e to the zero power is just going to be one. And one times c is going to be c, which means c equals negative m over g b. Let's plug that back in to this equation here v equals mg over b minus mg over b e to the power of negative b over m t. Let's factor out an mg over b and get 1 minus e to the negative b over m t equals v. Whew. Wow, look at all that algebra and all that calculus. I'd like you to remember this guy because I think we looked at something like this earlier. Hey, wait a minute. mb over g was the terminal velocity. That means that we can replace this with the terminal velocity of the equation. Now, if we look at an equation like this in something like Desmos, okay? I'm going to make up some values for you know, v of t and stuff like that, because it really, it's really irrelevant. I want to show you guys specifically what this is going to look like. Negative, I guess it doesn't really matter, 1 divided by 2, 1, x divided by 2. Take a look at this guy. 
does that not look like our velocity time graph that we thought was going to happen over time? Because all 1 minus e to the negative power of x graphs are going to look like this, where they reach some maximum value. What do you notice about what seems to be the maximum value of this line? It seems to be 10. 10 is the multiple in front of this group. And in this case, the multiple in front of the group is the terminal velocity. This leads me to show you that every type of graph that's going 1 minus e to the power of negative b over mt is going to have this curve to it, where the horizontal asymptote of that value is going to be given as the multiple in front of the group. And isn't that what we expected to see from our velocity time graph? Now, a couple of things before we get much further. The multiple in front of the time, if we do the inverse of that, so if I say negative m over b, I'm going to get something called the time constant tau, which means I can rewrite this one more time. Vt, 1 minus e to the t over tau. Tau. Tau is called the time constant. And what it does is it kind of gives you some knowable, volt, knowable multiples of the value of the terminal velocity. For every one tau of time, if time equals one tau, you're going to accomplish 63% of the terminal velocity. So if you do one tau of time, you're going to be going 63% of the terminal velocity. If you do two taus, two taus, you'll get 89% of the terminal velocity. Excuse me, that's 87%. I can't read my own writing. If you do three taus of time, if time equals three taus, you're going to get 95% of terminal velocity. So, you can, uh, these are knowable values that they want you to know about time constants on the AP test, and we're going to do plenty of first order differential equations. So this is going to keep on coming. So, if you get stuck, please go back through and check out all these notes done from the beginning. Good luck.